I'm here with Ian Dallas, the creative director behind The Unfinished Swan. Now, Ian, I've been wondering, what's it like going from working on a video game as a college project and then getting it published by Sony? Uh, well, in the case of Sony, it was actually uh, relatively easy because they've been so fantastic to work with. So, uh, you know, they were really supportive, and I think we uh, had similar goals. So a lot of times with publishers, uh, you know, there's sort of an adversarial relationship, but with Sony, they wanted something that was really strange and, you know, that people had never seen before, and that was exactly what I was interested in. So the conversation with Sony was really about, like, how do we make this thing happen, and you know, there are a lot of things I didn't know how to do, and so I could just go to them and say, you know, like, oh, what do I need here? You know, what do you think? Uh, and, and because we had similar goals, uh, you know, I felt comfortable saying, like, hey, I don't know how to do this. What would you suggest? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was uh, fantastic, and we didn't have to hide that we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, you know, I think that was part of the appeal for them was that they're, you know, getting things that the God of War team would not necessarily, you know, be coming up with. Now, can you talk a little bit about working on it during, while being in college? Uh, sure. So the game started out as a graduate student project when I was at the USC uh, Interactive Media Department. And, uh, you know, it's really just a little prototype. Like, every week I'd come up with these different ideas of, uh, you know, how people move around space. And so I'd come up with this little, like, interactive experiment. And one of the weeks it was this, like, what if you're in a white room throwing paint around? And uh, in school, it took me uh, like about eight months or so to figure out what the game would be off of that. Uh, you know, it's a very abstract concept. And uh, what I was really interested in is uh, that sense of discovery that you get in this white space. And you know, for me, that, that really felt a lot like what it was like reading books as a child, of like turning the page and not knowing what was gonna be there. And so children's books were kind of the, the inspiration for that. And just trying to, in school, like figure out where the rest of this, you know, thing was going to go was, was definitely, you know, a big challenge that I hadn't had any classes, you know, that, that would really prepare for that. Uh, but, you know, it was great to be in a place where, you know, I could, uh, you know, talk to, uh, you know, professors and, and, you know, other game developers uh, in school that were, you know, going through some of the, you know, same kind of challenges. One of the presentations you gave, you spoke about ac accessibility mm -hmm. and the importance of making the game feel right for players who have never played video games before because a lot of games today you walk into them and they expect you to know how to use two sticks at once. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, why you think it's important to make your game more accessible to people who have never picked up a controller before? Yeah, and, and I, I don't think that it's, um, it was necessarily our goal to make it uh, as broadly accessible as we could. I think our goal was to make it not needlessly difficult. Uh, and one of the things that was really surprising is that even playtesting the game early on, people that had never played a first-person game could still pick it up. And, you know, that felt like something that was worthwhile. And so we didn't want to, uh, you know, make things too complicated that would uh, prevent them from enjoying the game. Because I think a lot of people that, uh, you know, were interested in the game were people that just tend to not be that interested in uh, most mainstream games. So I think the biggest thing we did was to try to avoid having, like, forcing players to do too many things at once. So uh, we found that with a, a relatively new first person you know, player, they could usually get through, but it would take them a little longer to do that. So we tried not to you know, pile a bunch of things on, so like have you know, like time pressure or you know, complicated combat or jumping around. Uh, and, and generally, you know, the game didn't really require that. So it wasn't like we were you know, consciously trying to you know, restrict the game to, to appeal to a broader audience. Uh, it, it was more just, you know, being conscious of what are the things that uh, these folks find difficult and, you know, trying to make that a little bit easier. So, like, for our, our camera controls, like, one of the things that we did was um, when players are looking down and they walk forward, we kind of automatically, subtly adjust the camera so they're looking straight again because we found that a lot of people that had never played games, you know, would only either move or rotate the camera. Like, they'd move the player or they'd, they'd rotate uh, where they were looking. They wouldn't do both. And so they would look at something in the ground and then they would be like, alright, well now it's time to move on. And they just keep moving forward while still looking at the ground. So it was a way that we could just kind of give them a little bit of a helping hand and it worked out well because the people that are, you know, professional, or not professional, like very experienced first person uh, gamers, you know, they don't want to walk around looking at the ground either. But, you know, for them, they'll do that, you know, automatically 
uh, you know, it was just for the, the newer players that we could kind of give them a little bit of a helping hand without, you know, making it more, you know, annoying for the rest of the players. So it's kind of a win-win. One thing you also talked about uh, was not only the importance of accessibility, but that you wanted to make sure it didn't just have to conform to normal game stereotypes. Like, you mm -hmm. didn't want to have enemies show up. But you said that there were some decisions that you kind of were forced into making about adding more color to the game. Is that correct? Uh, well, I wouldn't say we were forced. Uh, it was something that we discovered as we were making the game that, uh, you know, because we started with this simple concept of a white room and, and black paint, and we found that just after playing that for about 15 minutes, it became a little oppressive. Like, the game stopped being about this sense of wonder after, you know, about 15 minutes or so of doing it, then you're kind of like looking for what the next thing is. And, uh, you know, for us, one of the next things was just aesthetically varying things up. So, you know, in the very beginning of the game, uh, you know, you go in the, I mean, you're in spaces that are relatively confined. So you're in a garden and you see things that are like, you know, around 10 feet away, generally, like when you're throwing these paintballs, you get a lot of feedback because the environment is very dense. Uh, and then after that, you know, one of the things we do is we, we introduce some shadows, we introduce some colors, but we also do things like, you know, we introduce more uh, movement in the world. So there'll be water that will be moving around, and there are larger spaces, and, and it's just about trying to keep up a sense of variety, uh, since that's a core part of trying to put people into this, uh, you know, sort of uh, mood of discovery. One thing you did say a lot was discovery, discovery, <laughs> discovery. Uh, and I noticed one other thing that was in the game that was kind of video gamey was the collectible balloons. Mm -hmm. Is that something that was a last minute idea or was it something you had earlier on? Uh, I think it came out halfway through the game uh, in terms of the development. It took about three years for us and I think balloons were like maybe a year and a half in and uh, actually it really ties right back into you know, this problem that we had of this relatively sterile world. So when it's all white and black, uh, you know, in a lot of the rest of the game too, it feels this, you know, it's a little bit cold. Uh, you know, partly because we didn't have enemies, and it just felt like you were wandering around this sort of desolate landscape. And the balloons were a way for us to kill a lot of birds with one stone. So the balloons were, uh, you know, it's a reward for players to go into places that, you know, weren't necessarily moving them farther into the game, but just like little corners that we can kind of say like, oh, you know, well, there's nothing here, but, you know, you did discover this, you know, little collectible thing. Uh, they added a bit of color, and they added a bit of movement, uh, you know, to, it's like the breeze, you know, would, would blow them around, uh, and they also just felt in keeping with the storybook tone of the game. So, it, I mean, it definitely was something that we struggled with a bit, uh, because it feels, Gamey, you know, to have these collectibles, but I think collectibles are there for a very good reason. Uh, that they introduce just like a little bit of reward for you know having players move around, you know, in place that's not like on critical path for you know, like the shortest distance to, to get through the environment. And for us, it felt like uh, you know it was um, not not too big of a leap that the game is fairly mechanically driven. I mean, from the very beginning, like you're throwing you know, these pink balls around, and so you're really like engaging with the game. And the collectibles also gave us a way to uh, give players things that they could unlock later. So they could, you know, use these collect like these balloons to buy, you know, I don't know, like different, uh, different abilities, uh, like, you know, like a fire hose that will, you know, like spray pink balls around or, uh, or whatever they're wanting, whatever they're interested in, which was another layer of discovery for the players, that they could, you know, have this thing that they sort of wanted to collect uh, and then, you know, eventually unlock new, new pieces of the game. Another One part of your game that really stands out is the graphics. It has a very unique style that makes it stand out from a lot of other indie games. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this push for video games graphics need to be hyper-realistic, they need to be at thir locked at 30 frames, and if there's one line less of resolution, it becomes this giant, big deal. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about, actually, is uh, hyper-realism for lighting. Like, in a lot of games, the lighting has historically been really flat, uh, because the technology just wasn't there to render things, like, while the game was running, or to save enough textures to be able to bake the lighting. And even in a stylized world, like Unfinished Swan, I think uh, having a really nice uh, lighting model, so, like, having uh, shadows that are really soft, you know, where it's not just like one colored shadows, uh, you know, helps to ground that space and make it believable. 
which is, you know, I think the difference between realism and believability. And so, the, like, especially for the next generation of consoles, like the PS4 and Xbox and, uh, you know, the new PC games that are coming out, uh, we all benefit. Like, it's a rising tide that lifts all boats. So, the technology is much easier for, for baking these lights uh, and then also for, for rendering them at runtime. And so, even in a stylized world, like what we had uh, in Unfinished Swan, you know, there are areas with shadows, uh, you know, I think they look a lot better having this richer, more believable uh, lighting system. So certainly, you know, every game doesn't need to be realistic looking, you know, in the way that like a Call of Duty does. And, you know, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes that, that people have this perception. Uh, you know, it's not just games too. I mean, movies struggle with that as well. There are a lot of movies that feel like they could be a little bit more expressive. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, people try to make things look believable and the most believable, like, I mean, the easiest way to do that is to make it look real, because that's what people are familiar with. But there's, you know, kind of a different layer of, of believability in the way that, you know, characters move or, you know, whatever, that, that I think it would be nice to see people take a little bit more, uh, you know, into account and to think about in, in making something that is expressive, that you have these, you know, ways of making things that feel more particular to your experience that, yeah, I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, it would be nice to see games explore that a little bit farther uh, than they do, but it's never been a better time, you know, and I think we're seeing a lot of people that are experimenting, uh, you know, much more so than, than historically, so that's, that's great. Your game has a lot of story elements. It's driven by this narrative structure of the storybook. How does the story within your game play, uh, work with the gameplay to create an engaging experience? Uh, so yeah, one of the things that we were really surprised by with our game is that uh, the cutscenes, you know, the points where we, we actually take control away from the players and, and tell them the story, uh, were a really nice way to put people at ease and to, uh, you know, because I think as, as game designers we, uh, we feel like we failed, you know, when we take control away and there's this idea that, uh, you know, the player has to always be in control. And that uh, you know you're just you're a lazy designer if you you know force them to look at something or, or you know read text or whatever. And you know I think it uh, it took a while for us to realize that we were getting a lot of benefit from it. That because in our game you know it's a very um, you know player directed experience that they're discovering these things for themselves. Like the game isn't telling them what to do. Uh, it was important for us to tell them that they had succeeded. Uh, and one of the ways that games historically have done that you know, is, is through cutscenes. And I think that worked really well for us, that uh, it was a moment for people to relax uh, you know, when, when the cutscenes you know, started. And you know, when the, uh, the little the letterboxes came down, we called those snack bars, uh, you know, the things that come down at the top of the screen, because we noticed that in playtests, that's when people would reach for their drink. And you know they'd be like playing and they'd be really engaged in it, and then the cutscenes would come up, and then you know they'd, they'd relax a little bit. And you know, I guess mean, like on the one hand, that that might be something that you would uh, be a little concerned about. It's like, oh, well, they've stopped caring about the game. But you know, I think they just played for 20 minutes, and they were kind of on the edge of their seat trying to figure out what was going on. Now they can rest. Uh, so for us, cutscenes, you know, aside from telling a story that we wanted to tell and, and putting people you know into this character and making them feel like a child again. Uh, they also really help the experience, uh, you know, to sort of mod modulate the tensions. So, you know, this is a point where you can't do anything, you're sort of forced to relax, but I think that that really helps to reset the player experience so that they can come into the next scene fresh, uh, you know, and that you get sort of build up again. And now that you've finished on the Unfinished Swan, uh, you, your website says that you've moved on and you're not doing a follow-up sequel. Mm -hmm. And you haven't really announced much about what's coming out. When can we expect to hear what you, Giant Sparrow is coming out with next? Uh, I hope soon. I honestly have no idea. I mean, we're working on this new game that we're super excited about. And uh, we've been working on it pretty much since Unfinished Swan uh, was released. So we're coming up on you know, a year and a half. And uh, it's, I think it's, in some ways it's probably a good thing that we haven't been talking about it. Because in the beginning, you know, we thought we knew what we wanted the game to be. And it's taken a lot of you know twists and turns, uh, just like Unfinished Swan did. I mean, I think uh, in a similar way, like we, we knew at a very high level what we wanted, but the sort of implementation of that and figuring out like what it felt like to be in these spaces uh, has, has definitely changed. So you know, there's no solid answer about when when we're going to announce it. But uh, you know, I think 
uh, hopefully soon is, is all I can say. That uh, you know, it's not necessarily up to us. I mean, we're working with an unannounced publisher on this unannounced game. And so if it were up to us, you know, we would probably be talking a little bit more. But it's probably not a bad thing that we haven't been talking too much because uh, you know, the beginning of this is uh, you know, so many things are changing all of the time that you know, it's probably a little bit confusing to tell people like, oh, this is what the game's gonna be, and then people get disappointed when it's nothing like that. Uh, but yeah, I would hope relatively soon. Great, well, thanks for taking the time to talk with me, sure, Ian. My pleasure. I appreciate it. I'm Steven Bieber for Glitched Online. Please go check out our website uh, for all sorts of gaming and tech news.